But this is somewhat different. This is the battle over Britain. And I want to start this battle when Britain was squarely in the Roman Catholic camp. And a king was ruling and the dates are over there. He ruled as king 1154 to 1189. As king of England, he was also king of Scotland. And his name was Henry II. And there he is. And this is where history gets a twist. Fascinating twist. Now let's jump to a somewhat more modern time. 2nd of February 2005, that's when the Pope died, and the newspapers in the world recorded his great activities, and in England they remembered the prayers as the Pope visited the UK in 1982. A memorable moment when the Pope climbed off his aeroplane in his customary way, he kissed the ground showing that the territory was whose? His. Now it's always interesting to watch what these globalists are doing. And in the afternoon a crowd of 80,000 gathered for mass at the Wembley Stadium in what was billed as the first of the Pope's outdoor spectaculars. They sung, careful note of what they had to sing, he's got the whole world in his hands and they clapped their hands as he arrived in his Pope mobile. He has the whole world in his hands. That's what he sang. This was the first visit of a Pope to that nation in centuries. Now, what else did he do? The Pope met with Prince Charles and the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury is apparently subject to whom? To the Queen, because she's the head of the Anglican Church. Following the death of the Pope, people in Kent have been remembering his historic visit to Canterbury in 1982. John Paul II became the first pontiff ever to visit the UK when he made the six-day tour of the country. Fascinating. First one, and he stayed six days. How many days? Six. He visited Canterbury Cathedral on the 29th of May to say prayer with the then Archbishop of Canterbury, who happened to be Robert Runcie. There he is in the picture. Streets were lined by 25,000 people, and the Pope told the congregation it was a day which centuries and generations have awaited. Wow, this is fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Now let's go back to a little bit of history and note what the Pope did. This is the BBC News, Saturday the 2nd, 2005. The BBC reports, the Pope and Dr. Runcie knelt in silent prayer at the place of the martyrdom, the spot where Sir Thomas A. Beckett was murdered in 1170. Now remember that nothing that they do is without purpose. And here the Archbishop and the Pope go and they kneel down there where all those centuries ago Thomas Beckett had been murdered. Hmm. Here is a relief of Thomas Beckett's murder and you have the four knights who overheard Henry II talking about this pestilent monk and they thought to do the king a favor by getting rid of him and they murdered him. And uh, the honorary canon of the cathedral when the Pope was there said, quote, it was a very moving moment to see the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury praying in the very spot where the most famous of all archbishops, Thomas A. Beckett, had fallen so many centuries ago. I would beg to differ on that point. But uh, who am I if I favor Cranmer over this gentleman? But nevertheless, he was here, according to them, the most famous archbishop 
that Canterbury ever saw. Now, why did the Pope kneel there? Why was it significant that he said, centuries have waited, has the whole world in his hand? Why was this significant? What happened all those centuries ago in the time of Henry II? Why was Archbishop Becket murdered? Well, let's read about it. In the tradition of Norman kings, Henry II was keen to dominate the church like the state. Here was a king, he said, I'm boss of my own country, and you church will listen to me. At Clarendon Palace on the 30th of January 1164, the king set out 16 constitutions aimed at decreasing ecclesiastical interference from Rome. Rome, you take second place in my country, I'm first. Do you do that to Rome and get away with it? But the newly appointed Archbishop of Canterbury refused to ratify the proposals. Henry was characteristic stub stubborn, and on the 8th of October, 1164, he called the Archbishop Thomas Becket before a royal council. And the Archbishop knew what was coming, so he fled. He fled to France, and there he was under the protection of Henry's rival, Louis VII of France. In 1170, the Pope was considering excommunicating all of Britain. Only Henry's agreement that Becket could return to England without penalty prevented this fate. So here was a war between church and state. Thomas A. Becket was murdered in 1170. The king was angry that he had to give in to this pressure and he made these remarks about this pestilent monk and his knights went and solved his problem. Actually they created a big problem. History is fascinating. You know there's an old saying which says Rome never forgets. Well Henry's knights wanted to do the king a favor. Just three years later, Becker was canonized and revered as a martyr. It took three years and he was a martyr. Against secular interference in God's church. Now you can understand why the Pope knelt there. Centuries later, Pope Alexander III had declared Thomas Becket a saint. And historian John Harvey believes it was yet another failure in Henry's religious policy, an arena which he seemed to lack adequate subtlety. And politically, Henry had to sign the Compromise of Avranche, which removed from the secular courts almost all jurisdiction over the clergy. So the king had to sign that he had no rights to control the clergy. This compromise in 1172 marked the reconciliation of Henry of II of England with the Catholic Church after the murder of Thomas Becket. Henry was purged of any guilt in Becket's murder, but he agreed that the secular courts had no jurisdiction over the clergy, with the exception of high treason, highway robbery, and arson. Fascinating. <coughs> Now what's even more interesting, he had to be punished. Now who is higher, the one who is punishing or the one who is being punished? Well, let's look at history. The murder had far-reaching consequences for England, but the immediate result was that Henry II had to make peace with the church. He did this four years later by performing penance at Canterbury Cathedral. He was beaten by 80 monks while wearing sackcloths and ashes. There is the picture. There's the poor king. Here are the monks beating the king. Naughty king. Hmm. And spent the night in vigil at St. Thomas Becket's tomb. The church had wasted no time and had canonized Becket. He also had to promise to raise money for the crusades and to either mount a crusade or make a pilgrimage. He did neither. There was enough to do at home. So he was in trouble. This king was in trouble and he was severely reprimanded and he got the hiding of his life. Fine. Now let's go a little bit further into history. Just just a couple of years. Now England was 
pretty humiliated. Can you imagine how they felt? Their king was beaten <laughs> up by monks, and uh, they had to pay all this money, supposedly. Well, King John's concession of England and Ireland. Now, King John is very famous. There he is, King 1167 to 1216. In the matter of the election and installation of Stephen Langton as Archbishop of Canterbury, King John, in the words of Pope Innocent III, had by impious persecution tried to enslave the entire English church. So here this next king comes, and he says, I don't want that archbishop, I want another one. And the Pope says, who do you think you are? I say what goes. Did we have a little altercation with China and the present Pope just recently? Oh, it was very interesting. You don't tell the Pope who's boss. And he said, King, you will listen to me. You will appoint the one I want. Hmm. As a result, the Pope laid on England an interdict, 1208 to 14, a sort of religious strike wherein no religious service was to be performed for anyone guilty or innocent. When, that didn't, when this didn't work, the king himself was excommunicated. Now you must remember how afraid those people were. If you weren't with the church, you were lost forever. The people were fear-struck. The king had been excommunicated. Caving in under that pressure, John wrote a letter of concession to the Pope, hoping to have the interdict and the excommunication lifted. The year was 1213. John's concession, which in effect made England a fiefdom of Rome. Please note where I've taken this from. This comes from sources of British history. So England became a fiefdom to Rome, worked like a charm. The satisfied Pope lifted the yoke he had hung on the people of England and their king. But that wasn't enough. King, put it there. Put it there. So the king went and he signed a declaration and he relinquished the crown. There is the picture of the crown being placed at the feet of the Roman prelate. The crown of England, Rome, is yours and I will rent it back at a fee fascinating history this is mind-boggling nobody even thinks about it today let's carry on now this is the concession he signed and I'm going to bore you by actually reading it because you cannot get more interesting history today than that this is the medieval source book, John the First's concession of England to the Pope. This is what he said. John, by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy, etc., etc., to all the faithful of Christ who shall look upon this present charter, greetings. We wish it to be known to all through this our charter, notice the words, charter, furnished with our seal, that inasmuch as we have offended in many ways God and our mother, the Holy Church, and in consequence are known to have very much needed the divine mercy and cannot offer anything worthy for making due satisfaction to God and to the Church unless we humiliate ourselves and our kingdom. We wishing to humiliate ourselves for him who hum humiliated himself for us unto death, the grace of the Holy Spirit inspiring, not induced by force or compelled by fear, but of our good, own good and spontaneous will and by the common counsel of our barons, do offer and freely concede to God and his holy apostles Peter and Paul and to our mother, the holy Roman Church and to our Lord Pope Innocent and his Catholic successors, the whole kingdom of England, the whole kingdom of Ireland, with all their rights and opportunities. So any future gain of that kingdom is conceded to whom? To the Pope. For the remission of our own sins and those of our whole race, as well for the living and for the dead, now receiving and holding them as it were as vassals. What is a vassal? One who serves. 
from God and the Roman church in the presence of that prudent man, Paul the subdeacon of the household of the Lord Pope, we perform and swear fealty. That means subservience. We swear fealty. To them, to him, our aforesaid Lord Pope Innocent and his Catholic successors in the Roman Church. According to the form apprehended and the presence of the Lord Pope, if we shall be able to come before him, we shall do liege homage. Wow! We are merely vassals to the Pope. Binding our successors and our heirs by our wife forever. In similar manner, to perform fealty and show homage to him who shall be chief pontiff at that time. Who's it today? Benedict. Well, here's an interesting document. And to the Roman church without demur. That's it. Done deal. As a sign, moreover, of this our own, we will and establish perpetual obligation and concession forever. We will establish that from the proper and special revenues of our set kingdom. And then he talks about how much money he's going to have to pay for renting back the privilege of the crown from the real owner who is now who? Who is the Pope? Who becomes the land lord. The word land lord comes from the lend lord. Now when you are a land lord you receive rent and for that you get certain privileges. So here is what they had to pay. We shall receive yearly a thousand marks sterling, namely at the Feast of St. Michael, etc., and then all these other fees that they had to pay, saving to us and to our heirs our right, liberties, and regalia. So our crown, our pomp, our glory, we have rented back from the Pope for this fee. We bind ourselves and our successors not to act counter to them. And now look carefully. If we or any one of our successors shall presume to attempt this, whosoever he be, unless being duly warned he come to his kingdom and his senses, he shall lose his right to the kingdom and this charter of our obligation and concession shall always remain firm. So if we break this agreement, we lose the crown forever. Wow. What happened? I'm excited. I want to know. I hope you are. Where did the king sign this? Now please note this. The plot thickens. This comes from the select historical documents of the Middle Ages. I, myself, this is the king, bearing witness in the house of the Knights Templars near Dover, in the presence of Marcha, Master Archbishop of Dublin, Master J. Bishop of Norwich, and then he goes through the whole list of who there was present. And he put his signature to it. So the crown belongs to Rome, but the king rented it back. Now, did they ever break the agreement? Well, that was a lot of money. A thousand pound a mark sterling plus the other fees that had to be paid plus the Peter's penny that had to be paid. Britain groaned under this king. This is where the legends come in of uh, the time of Robin Hood and all of those. Although history has been distorted there. The timing is wrong, but the event is interesting. Well, King John caved under the pressure of his barons who couldn't afford the taxes. And so he signed the Magna Carta on June 15, 1215. And the Magna Carta is a famous document. And in this document, he 
promise to pay respect to what the barons and the lords of the empire said more so than what someone else said. And so they refused from then on to pay the thousand marks sterling. What did they do when they refused to pay that? They broke the agreement. King John broke the terms of this charter by signing the Magna Carta in June 15, 1215. Remember the penalty for breaking it? Was the loss of the crown the right to the kingdom to the Pope and the Roman Church? It says so quite plainly, to formally and lawfully take the crown from the royal monarch in England by an act of declaration on the August 24, 1215. Pope Innocent annulled the Magna Carta. Later in the year, he placed an interdict prohibition on the entire British Empire, and from that time until today, the English monarchy and the entire British crown belong legally to the Pope. Now, England wasn't always very good to the Pope. And there were things like reformations. And King Henry, who said, blow the Pope, I don't care about him. He had other interests. His was more an uh, androgenic problem than anything else. Well, let's not go into the details of that. Here is the picture of the king signing the Magna Carta, breaking the agreement. Only three of the original clauses on the Magna Carta are still law. All the rest has been rescinded today. Please note what is still law. So this portion is still okay. One defends the freedom and the rights of the English church. Another confirms the liberties and customs of London and the other towns, but the third is the most famous, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled, nor will we proceed with force against him except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. To no one will we sell to do, to no one deny or delay right of justice. It has resonant echoes in the American Bill of Rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everything else has been rescinded. All right, the reason I stopped here for a minute is to look at what this term free man means, because free man does not mean in English law what these people think a freed man is. A free man was a freed man who had been freed by his Lord to tend a certain amount of land and actually have some kind of like sharecropping say-so in the land. But this is all under feudalism and serfdom. And you can see here in this term that a serf who occupied a plot of land were required to work for the lord of the manor who owned the land. British people never owned land. The lords, the ladies, and the crown owned the land. Now, I'll find a specific term in here if I can find it called villain. It's where we get the word villain. It's also where we get the word villi or village because that's where the villeins lived. You can also see here etymology the word serf comes from the word serve, so they're servants serving the British lords and ladies and the crown. It also says here that what we now call serfs were usually designated in Latin as colony. This is where the British had colonies. It's where all the servants lived. This is all about slavery. It's always been about slavery. It's always been about the Roman Catholic Church and using religion to control people versus using Roman Caesarian governmental edict. The Caesars moved the power of Rome into the church. They created the religion. They wrote the Bible. They wrote the Koran. Okay, we can see here that a free man became a serf usually through force or necessity. Sometimes the greater physical and legal force of a local mandate, I'm sorry, magnet, Intimidated freeholders or allodial owners in dependency. Now, everyone thinks that allodial title is the highest title. It is not. Sovereign land grant title is the highest title because these are done by concession or by occupation where lands used to not be claimed. 
that doesn't even exist today in this world because satellites have claimed all the land. And we have this word vassal, akin to a ceremonial homage where a vassal places his hands between those of his overlord. Here again, the lords, the ladies, the land lord, the landlord. And we can see here in the seventh century, the Anglo-Saxon oath of fealty, which today is called an oath of allegiance. It's all legions. You have pledged all to your liege by the Lord whom we home here again by the Lord this is a man Lord is a man that's why they put it in the Bible the Pope owns everything which means he is the Lord and that G right there everything to them is about symbols I've shown you this in the past right yeah. the G starts with the man's forehead right there comes around the back of the head and that little spot in the middle is the tongue God is a man Gad, G-D in the Hebrew. Gad means good luck. And it's pronounced God in Hebrew. Okay, here's serfdom class system. In peasantry, it's often broken down into smaller categories. Free man whose tenure within the manor was freehold. Who still owned the land? The lord of the manor, right? Correct. So he got to hold it for the lord. And then you have the Valines. All right, free men or free tenants held their land by one variety of contracts and feudal land tenure. Tenure, where we get the word tenant, were essentially rent paying tenant farmers who owned, owed little or no service to the Lord. They still had to pay. Free man up to 10% of the peasant population. The other 90% were Valines or something lower than a Valine. And there you go, Vil Vilinage, that's where we get the word village, Viliage. And then you had uh, Bordars and Cottagers, and then you had slaves. Now, I don't know why the other ones weren't considered slaves, because if you were not a lord, you were a slave. This is why they talk about the sheriff, and the sheriff is the highest law officer in the land. Yeah, because he was the tax collector for the lords. That's what the, lord of no uh, that's what the sheriff of Nottingham did. He collected money for his lord. Anyway, I'm not going to belabor this anymore. Let's go back to watching this thing. So Rome really owns the kingdom. Theirs is the crown. And for the monarchs today to have the crown is actually a pretense. The Templars own the crown. Now who are the modern Templars? Who are the modern Templars? That is the question. Templars have disappeared. Now, if you, I'm not going to go through my previous lectures where we talk about all the secret societies. You can get them on the DVDs, but I'll just give you a little clue. Here are the Knights Templars. Please note their regalia. Here is a Templar. This is the Templar robe. Notice that he has the sash on the left side with the Templar cross on it. Their main symbol is, of course, the crown with the cross. They have united the power of regalia, of kings, with that of the cross. And they are in control. They control the kings through the Knights Templars. All the Knights Templars' successors. Now, who were the successors? Please note the rope. Look at it carefully. And then let's go to the Catholic Encyclopedia. This comes from the Catholic Encyclopedia here. Is this the same looking robe, yes or no? Hospitalers of St. John of Jerusalem, also known as the Knights of Malta. The most important of all the military orders, both of the extent of its area and for its duration. It is said to have existed before the Crusades and is not extinct at the present time. Now the Knights of Malta, of course, are in cohesion and collusion with the Jesuits. And there were even wars between Jesuits and the Knights of Malta. And the Jesuits, the Black Pope, is actually the controlling power behind the whole scene. But each of these orders are subservient to him. Now, there are Protestant groups today that are pretended Protestant groups but are actually Knights of Malta. Now I wonder who would wear a similar robe
to that, being subservient only to the Pope. Because the Knights of Malta are a military papal order. Oh. Fascinating. And there we have our Queen. And she has the regalia of the Hospitallers. Now it's claimed to be the Protestant version. So the Queen meets volunteers from St. John's Ambulance. Her Majesty is Sovereign of the Order of St. John. The emblem of the Order of St. John, the English Protestant ecumenical branch of the Order of Malta, which is a Catholic secret society. Now let's have a look at the Knights of Malta. Okay, there's no need to belabor this anymore. People can go watch this. It's called Rekindling the Reformation, which is nothing more than a movement that was likewise disavowed at the Council of Trent by the Catholic Church because they own the Bible. They wrote it. It's their copyrighted intellectual property. And the Protestants may protest. That's what a protestant is. But they haven't changed anything. It's governmental. The churches and the governments are all governmental. And they do this together. The Jesuits have 33,000 plus members and they're all in power behind every nation state on this planet, either as the ruler, as the president, or the executive branches behind these presidents and prime ministers. So when these people want to say, well, I believe in the Bible. Okay, well, mentally, you just got governed because they wrote it. It's theirs. They hold it by copyright. You're, you now become part of their copywritten intellectual property by law, and that's how they judge you is by law. Same thing is true of something like the Magna Carta. They want to come in and claim the Magna Carta. Well, you're not signatory to it, but you're claiming it. Governmental. It's been disavowed. It's of no use. So therefore, you have just claimed something that is of absolutely no use. Now we can judge you in whatever manner we want to. Why? Because you have an oath of all allegiance to us. So for these people in these Facebook groups, it's like you said about the movie Avatar. When she's looking at him and she says, you know, you have a strong heart, but you're arrogant, you're dumb and stupid and ignorant like a child. When you talk to me about these forums, this is what I see. They're dumb and stupid and ignorant like a child. They want to tell you what their opinion of common law is. Well, their opinion doesn't matter. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a judge. Uh, could I have your opinion so I can make a determination here today? No, I'm going to make the determination based on the contract. Contract law. You have an oath of allegiance. That's your contract. And I'm going to judge you in accordance with that. And since you come in here, and let's say it's the United States where they have put it in their code under Title I, Section 1, the very first definition is of insane, insane person and lunatic. Well, you're non compass mentis. You're a lunatic. I can do with you whatever needs to be done with you to for the public at large because we have to save the public from lunatics like you, which is why they call the sovereign citizen movement in case law, which is now common law, because that's what common law is, is case law. They call it the sovereign citizen domestic terrorist movement. So go ahead and claim your constitutions that you're not signatory to, and go claim your declarations that were not done for you because they did it for each other to rule over you, and where, see where that lands you. All constitutions are written as it says, for the international public order. These people are going to maintain the international public order. And if you want to believe in all that garbage, then thereby have your oath of allegiance and all your mental contracts. Everything starts in the mind. It's a prison for your mind. You cannot see it. You cannot smell it. You cannot touch it. You can see it in a way because like at the end of that movie, it said you have to know the code to be free. You have to be able to see the code. And that's why your opinion does not matter. It's not about opinion. If you don't know the code, you cannot alter your status in the matrix. See, this is why I talk about the fact that these people have no solution. They only gripe. They only complain. They only whine. And 4,000 years of history has told us this doesn't work. So if you go to www.therightofselfdetermination.com, which is a principle of international law, whereby you can use it to come out of the system because you now know the code, meaning the international code, not all the little statutes that you're being governed by, rules, common law, judges law, and we see here matrix solutions. 
So if we go to a presentation, this one's called Age of the Matrix 3, and we scroll down. All the stuff I just said about governmental, it's all explained right here. Starts with diction, meaning jurisdiction. One means to speak the truth, and the other one means to speak the truth. So it's a double truth. And they're telling you when they have jurisdiction over you, we're telling the truth because you're lying. That's why you have lie ability. That's why you have to have a lie sins because your lies are sins. They have jurisdiction. Jurisdiction means authority. Permission. Well, you gave your permission to your liege lord. Whether it was done at birth by your parents, which you've not undone, so therefore tacit acquiescence says it's a done deal. It, you were born with the same status your parents had. Slaves in the past never questioned this. So they've given people today more of an illusion of freedom and liberty, liberty, to take liberties with the planet and otherwise destroy the planet, destroy each other, which is why they're being governed. They have to be, because they're not self-governing. In the Law of Nations it says that man enjoys all of his rights and benefits and privileges when he takes the duty to exercise peace. It's only at peace do we get all of our natural benefit and natural rights. But obligations and duties have to be performed as before you get the rights. This is what it says in the Law of Nations. This is natural law. If you don't perform your duties, you go to jail. You deserve to be governed. You're not doing your job. You're not doing your duty. What is your duty? It's in treaty again, international law, to treat each other as brothers one to another. All men should treat each other as brothers one to another. And for these governmental people that are mentally controlled by the Bible and the Koran and all the rest of them, every single religion on this planet tells them to treat their brothers equally to themselves. The golden rule. It's real simple. So we look at the word government. What is a government? It's the act of governing. The body of persons that constitutes the governing authority of a political unit. Well, if you're not in it, you have no immunity, you're not governing, and you've given up your power to self-govern. That's what the founders of the USA did. Last time this was done correctly, we assume among the powers of the earth our separate and equal station. Well, citizens are not equal. They have no immunities, and they are governed. They have an oath of all allegiance to their liege lord. So in Black Six... The sovereign or supreme power in a state or nation. The machinery by which the sovereign power in a state expresses its will, expresses its function. Or the framework of political institutions, departments, and offices by means of which the executive, judicial, legislative, administrative business of the state is carried on. Business. It's business. This is all contract. Everything on this planet, everything in this universe is contract. Everything in this universe is agreement. It all is supposed to operate in harmony. This is the problem with human nature. In other words, we are not entitled to our opinion. What people should say is, I have an entitlement to my opinion. No, you don't if your opinion is wrong. What you have is a consequence for your choice. Either your right choice or your wrong choice. Consequence, not entitlement. So it comes from the Latin, gubernator signifies the instrument of the helm whereby the ship to which the state was compared was guided on its course by the gubernator or the helmsman, and in that view the government is but an agency of the state. See, the people that form the state are the state. As they said in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution, we do this for each other. We pledge our lives, fortune, and honor to each other. We don't care about all the rest of you citizens, subject, debtor, slaves that are in the colony of the king. Except for the fact that we're going to tax the crap out of you too because as soon as the king gives us the land grant, you're not going to pay us the land rent or the land tax because you're going to be our tenant. It's in, what, Chisholm versus Georgia. It says they were sovereigns but sovereigns without subjects with none to govern but themselves. Why? Because the king's colonies were still the king's colonists. They didn't do it for them. They hired a mercenary conscript army and they paid them. But they were the ones paying they were the guarantors, the payors, not the payees. So they rented their labor to fight a war against their king and have a civil war, quote, rebellion, breaking the law against the king. If they'd exercised this peacefully, they could have used Article 33 in the Law of Nations to simply sell their lands and take with them all their effects and form up under a new form somewhere else, not on the king's land. All of their grants came from the king. But they were given the power to set up the government by the king as long as they did it at the approbation of the king. That's the terminology used by Patrick Henry, approbation of the king. It's in the Virginia Resolves. They still believed in the divine right of kings. They were still subject to the divine right of kings. 
because governmentally, it was mentally in their mind that they believed that the king was superior. It says in Hunter's notes that they never disputed the priority or equality of rank. Therefore, Hartley Esquire, who was the plenipotentiary for the king, when they signed that peace agreement, he said, the republic is subservient to the crown. He agreed with it, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the United States of America agreed with it as well and sent their letters. So the summary is this. Govern means to control. Mint comes from mentis or mens or mind means mind. So it's governmental. And the T is a symbol. Here again. The T is a sword. It's in the shape of a sword. So governmental means G, which is God, over men or the mind by the sword. But see, they're not the ones that wield the sword. They put that in all the idiots' hands and get them to kill each other because that's human nature. Like they said in that movie, Aftershock, the only thing worse than Mother Nature is human nature. So without taking responsibility, they can whine, gripe, and complain all they want. They're not getting out of the matrix. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice. Tumbling down the rabbit hole? Hmm? You could say that. I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up. Ironically, this is not far from the truth. Do you believe in fate, Neil? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. I know exactly what you mean. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind. I want to stop there for just a second. This is apropos for everything that we just covered with this Magna Carta, because this is sitting in there like a splinter in their mind. They're trying to find where they have their rights. But they're ignorant like children, arrogant beyond belief, human nature, arrogant, egotistical beyond belief, not willing to spend 20 to 30,000 hours studying international law, figuring out how this planet operates. The matrix controlled the planet, not just their little household, because this is what they're going to do. They're going to control human nature and control mankind if they have to crush it into oblivion, which it deserves for all the wars and murders that, that humans inflict on each other. The Matrix is everywhere. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. And this is why they're whining. This is why they're crying like little children. They know the truth of this, that they were born slaves. If that's true, that could mean you are part of this system. Another kind of control. Keep going. How can I trust you? Bingo. It is a pickle, no doubt about it. Bad news is there's no way if you can really know whether I'm here to help you or not. So it's really up to you. But why help us? We're all here to do what we're all here to do. I'm interested in one thing, Neil, the future. And believe me, I know, the only way to get there is to get there. Why? Well, there, there are reasons, but... Usually, a program chooses exile when it faces deletion. And why would a program be deleted? Maybe it breaks down. Maybe a better program is created to replace it. Happens all the time. And when it does, a program can either choose to hide here or return to the source. 
the machine mainframe. Yes. Where you must go. Where the path of the one ends. You've seen it. In your dreams, haven't you? The door made of light. Our time is up. Listen to me, Neo. You can save Zion if you reach the source, but to do that, you will need the Keymaker. The program Smith has grown beyond your control. Soon he will spread through this city as he spread through the Matrix. You cannot stop him. If that's true, then I've made a mistake and you should kill me now. <laughs>